<clears throat> Welcome to the annual UCLA Lecture in the Sciences. It is my privilege and pleasure this evening to introduce to you on behalf of the University Committee on Public Lectures and the UCLA chapter of the Society of the Sigma Psi, one of the country's most distinguished scientists, Dr. George B. Kistiakowski, Abbott and James Lawrence Professor of Chemistry at Harvard University. Professor Kistiakowski, known to his students, though clandestinely, as GBK, or Kisti, is perhaps himself the best living example of science in contemporary society. Born in the white Russian city of Kiev at a time when cataclysmic revolutions were brewing both in Russia and in the physical sciences, he emigrated to America via Germany after World War I and became a naturalized citizen in 1926. Armed with his fresh doctoral degree from the University of Berlin, he arrived at Princeton as a two-year International Education Board Fellow in Physical Chemistry and stayed on there for an additional two years as research associate. In 1930, he began his lifelong association with and devotion to the Department of Chemistry at Harvard University. In those days, of course, scientists were aloof from the nation's political councils, not to mention that they weren't often consulted. But World War II changed all that, and George Kistiakowski was at least partly responsible for that change. When the physicists designing the first atomic bombs realized they would need chemical explosives to get things started, they cast about for a likely explosives expert. Not finding one immediately, they requisitioned George Kistiakowski as one who would have the capability of inventing what was needed as he went along. Thus was born the high explosives branch of the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. Few projects were ever a more resounding success, and Professor Kistiakowski received a presidential citation for his contributions. Among these contributions, one has no parallel. On the eve of the first atomic test at Alamogordo, when all personnel had been carefully withdrawn to a safe distance, it occurred to the suspicious mind of the general in charge that no one was guarding the bomb. It thus developed that Professor Kistiakowski spent a very lonely all-night vigil under the tower with a great 45 revolver strapped to his belt, hoping they wouldn't forget him. After the war, when Professor Kistiakowski needed to blast out some stumps at his farm in Lexington, his presidential citation as an atomic explosives expert proved uncommonly useful. It was the trump card that persuaded the local Massachusetts government to issue him a blaster's license. When he was able again to return to his first love of physical chemistry, he reestablished his research program with problems ranging from the study of energy migration in photochemically excited molecules to the catalytic properties of enzyme systems. In the post-war period of the exaltation of the sciences, such universality could not long escape government service. After several years of commuting to Washington in the service of innumerable government committees, Professor Kistiakowski was tapped in 1959 to succeed Jim Killian as the second special assistant to the President for Science and Technology, a post he held during one of the most critical periods, which I hope and expect he will describe in more detail for us tonight. Meanwhile, his work and accomplishments had come to be recognized through a number of outstanding awards. He is recipient of the Medal of Merit, the Nichols Medal, the British Medal for Service in the Cause of Freedom, the Priestley Award, the Willard Gibbs Medal, the Medal of Freedom, the Ledley Prize, 
And if he'd keep his uh, biography and who's who up to date, I'd have some more to tell you. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Chemical Society, the American Physical Society, the Faraday Society of England, the Philosophical Society, the American Academy, and the Royal Society of the Arts. He is an al also an honorary fellow of the Chemical Society of London. At the moment, although he has returned to Harvard on what he hoped would be a full-time basis, he has not yet quite succeeded in falling off the Washington carousel. He is a special consultant to the Presidential Scientific Advisory Committee, a member of the advisory board of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, and vice president of the National Academy of Sciences. Few indeed are those who can speak with such a background of experience and authority on the subject Dr. Kistiakowski has chosen for this evening, science in contemporary society. I present to you Professor George B. Kistiakowski. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here on this very fine occasion, and I'm uh, especially grateful to Dr. McMillan for his very kind uh, introduction, because it's really very difficult uh, to do justice uh, after an introduction like that. But I've, naturally, I'll try to do my best. Now, the subject of uh, science and society, science and government, and so on, has become uh, uh, somewhat popular these days. And it's very hard to be original anymore. And so I thought I'd select a particular quotation. I would have called it a text if I was in a pulpit, uh, as a theme of my talk tonight. It is an observation by a not very well known, but obviously deep thinking philosopher of science, Fournier Dalb. And I will quote it to you. Science used to be an elegant pastime for gentlemen. Now it has degenerated into a middle class profession. And. Uh, now, those of you who are young, who haven't lived through this process, needn't feel upset by it, but for an old timer like me, who all his life tried to climb up the social ladder, uh, it's awfully hard to realize that while you are climbing up, the ladder itself has been sliding down. <laughs> And it's uh, not only you see the scientific research has become a middle class profession, obviously not a very nice description of it, but it's also become quite controversial. I mean, if you just read the remarks about science and scientists by such distinguished citizens as Jack Barzun of Columbia University, Robert Hutchins, I believe a fellow Californian now, Don Price at Harvard, Congressman Royce, uh, you realize that it really is not uh, always uh, easy to be a scientist. And now, why all of this? Well, really, of course, much of these remarks are just uh, crude envy, the fact that uh, the federal government hands out about half a, a one and a half billion dollars a year to scientific research. And let's be realistic, there are in the country a few so-called star professors who uh, get pretty fancy salaries and do no teaching. And some of them manage to publish uh, more than 200 scientific papers a year, if you can call them scientific. Uh, but then, to make sort of things even, yeah, I want to warn you that there's a lot of, quite a few non-scientists who make also a pretty good living by running seminars on science and public policy. <laughs> so perhaps it isn't all one-sided. Now, what is all that's happened to science? And I'd like, I think, to understand this, I'd like to speak a little bit uh, about sort of historical perspective.
certainly until sometime around the middle of 19th century, science was what uh, Dalb calls the elegant pastime of gentlemen. It was really an intellectual endeavor, uh, an effort to understand uh, physical phenomena, life phenomena, by an application of something then rather new, the scientific method. And uh, in that sense, science, I think, could be easily called the successor to metaphysics, to much of speculative philosophy. And if you look at the time and place where the uh, most active science was uh, professed, you find very little connection then to the time and place where the major technological progress was being achieved. There really was virtually no connection between natural sciences and uh, technological innovations, that is, to inventors of the day, and therefore there was very little connection between science and uh, the progress of material civilization, although I think a very, very important connection between science and culture, the growth of culture. Somewhere around 100 years ago, there began a transformation with the fruits of which uh, we see today. And that was realization largely by private industry that uh, scientific knowledge can be put directly to practical use via the well now, now well-known development process. Probably the first beneficiary of this systematic exploitation of scientific research was the German dye industry, which around the turn of the century acquired almost a world monopoly. Came electrical industry and uh, the great uh, industrial research laboratories began to be established and go, and a transformation thus began, which sees us now in a civilization where essentially everything can be traced back to laboratory research, sometimes only 10, 15 years ago, sometimes much longer. And so in a sense, you might say, everything in our civilization is science-based. Now, in the 20th century, another process began, which now has reached extraordinary proportions, and that is the support of science, scientific research, by democratic governments. Of course, princelings, long before then occasionally loved to have scientists next to dwarfs to entertain them. But uh, this was a somewhat different approach. And uh, I like to think that democratic governments are really the society as a whole. And so we find this change of, of society as a whole now committing itself to support of scientific research, and that has grown to extraordinary proportions now and uh, actually extends to all democratic governments in industrially advanced countries. Now, the uh, two questions arise immediately. Why do the governments do it? And the second, perhaps a subsidiary, why do, why is why don't they let private enterprise, at least in, uh, in a society which is based on competitive enterprise, do it instead? Well, to explain why the government, for our government, of course I speak now primarily, does it, I can do no better than to read to you a short statement by the Deputy Director of the Budget, uh, Mr. Elmer Staats, who has been 
primarily concerned with techni technical aspects of the budget for many years. And he's the man who recommends to the president in the end what money to put into scientific support. And this is part of his testimony before an important congressional committee. And as he says, uh, he says as follows. It is important to note one basic point in allocating R&D resources, namely that the bulk of our R&D effort is not conducted and supported for its own sake, but to meet national action goals through agency missions. By agency, that's officially, he means departments and AEC and National Science Foundation, all of them are agency to him. We have a plurality of national goals, he says. We are seeking simultaneously to improve our society on many fronts. National security, the exploration of space, the strengthening of education, better housing, better health, better transportation, job opportunity, arms control, better international understanding, economic growth, elimination of poverty, improvement of energy, and water resources. Uh, by the way, he forgot also a not an important item of international prestige, to which quite a few billion dollars are devoted a year nowadays. Uh, now he says, uh, since the department and agencies exist to carry out specific missions, it's reasonable to expect that R&D needs and opportunities will be identified in a mission context by the departments and that agency budgets will be shaped in terms of sharing the budget dollar realistically among all kinds of mission supporting requirements, research being one of them. And this is terribly important to realize that this is uh, what this officially authorized statement is. We clearly aren't getting our money because we are very intellectual. That was not mentioned list. Uh, now, why should the government be doing it? Why not let private enterprise do it? Well, actually, it turns out that in private enterprise, the ratio of money going for long-range research, as compared with, with what goes to, for practical applications, is always very low. And there's a very good argument, namely that there's too much danger because of unpredictability of basic research that what your laboratory will discover will be helpful not to you, but to your competitors. And that's a very important consideration for an industrial, profit-motivated organization. And the result is, the tendency is to wait for somebody else to develop new scientific knowledge, and then use it effectively for your practical objectives. Uh, the argument for the government involvement in it, in it is really rather crude, namely our society is so large, it's so pluralistic, that we have a great degree of confidence that almost every unpredictable result of scientific research will be of use to our society. Uh, now, I think this is something that the virtually all economists agree with. What economists are actually not completely convinced in is whether we get the best return on dollar invested by putting as much money into scientific research relative to other investments as we do. But even though some economists don't agree, uh, the fact is that evidently the governments uh, have decided this is the case because, as I said, virtually all of them do it, and I don't think they could have all been just bamboozled by the scientists. Now, once you take um, 
the Bureau of the Budget's definition of reasons for doing research, it would be extraordinarily easy for an unwise government um, management to really make a mess of science by just interpreting what is useful to our mission very narrowly and claiming that every uh, bureaucrat, let's call him, sitting in Washington knows best what kind of scientific research is good for the practical task he has been assigned. Um, this fortunately hasn't happened in the United States. In fact, just the reverse has happened. And why? Well, I think that there's a number of factors which have contributed to really an extraordinary phenomenon of American science, which before the war was well established, but certainly not the leading science in the world, having in 20 short years since the war moved into a position of indisputable leadership in the world. And these factors, I could list a few. I think perhaps one of them is uh, a very enlightened federal science policy in recognizing that the government, the professionals in it, can't act in these matters as a big brother saying what must be done, but must constantly maintain an open dialogue with the scientific community seeking its advice and by and large accepting it. And this is uh, why so many of us, as, and I'm one of them, as Dr. Macmillan said, uh, come you to Washington. The second factor is the recognition by virtually all government agencies that um, the, this concept of relevancy, mission orientation, has to be taken very broadly. Um, the third, and I think terribly important, step was a recognition quite early in the game that scientific research, basic research, is best coupled to process of graduate education, in other words, should be centered in institutions of higher learning. This is not so everywhere. In the Soviet Union, for instance, a very different path was chosen where research institutes were deliberately isolated from the universities and the last few years, as their society has become less rigid and began to evolve, there have been very vigorous efforts to undo the damage, to bring these research institutes closer to universities. Another important factor is uh, decentralization of research support among several government agencies. In fact, seven agencies with specific practical missions, health in case of National Institutes of Health or defense in the military space and so on. And finally, National Science Foundation, which uh, you might say also has a practical mission it's responsible for the training of young scientific manpower. And because of that diversification of support, uh, the support has been spread rather evenly over all the sciences. In effect, a good research proposal, if it isn't accepted by one agency, is very likely to support find support elsewhere, which again, I, I think, does not exist in all the countries and sometimes with very unfortunate results. 
And I come last to something which I, in a sense summarizes several items I've mentioned, but to me is the most important one of the lot, namely a recognition by our government policy makers that because of the unpredictability of the value and usefulness and even the nature of scientific research results. This concept of relevancy to the missions of the government agencies must be limited to the gross, the, if I may use the language of statistical mechanics, to the macroscopic scale of science. And what I mean by that, that uh, is that, for instance, National Institutes of Health is not interested in astronomy and therefore uh, why should it support it? Or the space agency is not interested in general biology. It doesn't see any application of general biological work, so it doesn't support it. On the contrary, uh, the, at least in the days of greater abundance of money, uh, there the defense agencies used to support almost everything, I guess, except archaeological expeditions, um, because they felt that almost every branch of science might find uses in military technology. And then we have those, this relevancy on the macroscopic scale, but we also have a deep commitment on the part of most policymakers in Washington to a um, lack of such relevancy, I mean, lack of insistence on such relevancy on the microscopic scale, and by that I mean the scale of an individual researcher. And that, of course, is what really amounts to is a freedom of scientific choice. And is particularly relevant to what is also called nowadays little science, that is the typical academic science as distinguished from very large projects. And this is the one, uh, this is the part I would like to say now a few words about um, because it's a, a subject which I think is terribly important and a subject which is to some extent is under political attack nowadays. The federal government supports uh, scientific research in universities by a variety of mechanisms. Among them are uh, fixed some contracts for very large projects, say building of the linear accelerator at Stanford or something like that. Uh, it um, uh, has so-called training grants but it also gives a very substantial fraction of total research money by the mechanism of research project grants and very similar small contracts. The dialogue with the scientific community I mentioned earlier, I think takes its uh, best expression in this latter mechanism. Because here it has become traditional for the Washington agencies to seek opinion of the peers, of the men who make research proposals, either on an individual basis or by means of panels or committees. Scientists who are essentially uh, the same kind as the applicants, familiar with the subject, attempt to arrange these proposals in order of scientific excellence, which is the assigned task. I wouldn't claim that the assignment is always right, and I wouldn't even claim that uh, personal friendships and such like don't occasionally play a role. I think, though, very deeply, con I'm very deeply convinced that on an average, this is a very good assignment. And the 
uh, federal agencies then take this order of excellence and accept it with very minor modifications, but of course reserve the freedom if the total, the macroscopic assignment of money is not sufficient to support only the upper third, upper half, sometimes only upper 10 percent. And you see, in this way, the purely scientific judgment as to the excellence of each individual scientific idea, proposal, is blended with the mission relevancy on a large scale. The same technique leads to an extraordinary freedom of scientific choice because as, well, the unfriendly people would call them fads in science, come and go, but I would like to use a more elegant word, namely as new exciting opportunities open in science, uh, the brighter scientists shift their interests, they begin to think of projects in the new field, and this creates a shifting proposal pressure. More proposals in a new line of research than a year ago, and many times more perhaps than five years ago. And the impressive thing is that by and large the government responds well to these shifting pressures, supports the new kind of research, and I submit that in this peculiar economy of scientific research where the resources come from people who are really not interested as science as such, but are interested only in practical uses of the projects of research, that this constitutes an extraordinary degree of freedom of scientific choice. And something which I think is quite indispensable for progress of science. Now, um, what has been achieved by this process in 20 years, by a growth of the federal scientific budget going to universities from, I don't know, something like 10, 20 million dollars, no, maybe a little more, right after the war, to slightly more than a billion dollars today. As I mentioned before, what has been achieved, first of all, uh, something is very pleasing to naturally to American scientists, namely unquestionable world leadership of American science which can be measured by a number of criteria that I think are reasonably relevant. The number of the fraction of Nobel Prizes coming to the United States, the fraction of elections to various foreign honorary societies, and perhaps most significantly of all, by the frequency with which American scientific papers are cited in foreign literature. And such citation, uh, mentioning something for the non-scientists around here, because it requ uh, essential basis for preparing a logically developed scientific paper. We also have achieved, and I can't claim, of course, for a moment that this is due to science as such, but I submit it might not have happened without scientific progress. Uh, we have achieved an extraordinary progress in our technology, technological innovation. A progress where again we are clearly standing ahead of any other nation in the world. And in fact we are now in a position which makes things quite awkward. Uh, the, uh, during the war, Secretary of the Treasury, Morgenthau, suggested to President Roosevelt that in order to prevent uh, the resurgence of German militarism, Germany after the war should be converted into a purely agricultural, non-technological country. Uh, 
Now that became known as this became sort of leaked out to the public and was qu quickly killed as a political proposal, but became known as morgantizing Germany. Well, uh, you go now to Western European countries and they complain about being morgantized because they contend that our, the progress of our, our technology is such they, that they cannot compete with us in trade in sophisticated technological projects. They point out that the so-called technological balance of payments is completely skewed in our favor where uh, we are paying only one-tenth on the average for European patents and uh, special know-how and so on as they are paying us and uh, this has now reached the status of a major political issue in Europe. Well, so far I've been uh, beating the drums in favor of us scientists. Let's talk about some negative or critical issues which arise. There's a lot of people, and among them, one or two undergraduates with whom I spent the evening yesterday, who have a strong feeling that uh, we simply have too much science. Why not slow down, so to speak? Uh, well, I just immediately have reaction, no, why should we slow down? Actually, the, uh, in, in the context of the entire economic life of the country, Scientific effort is still extremely minute. It's about one quarter of the money uh, that goes to science is one quarter of the money that goes for the cosmetics. And I submit that uh, over the next 10 or 20 years, the present about a third of 1% of the gross national project would grow to 10 times the uh, absolute amount and possibly therefore to five times the amount in relation to GNP without in the slightest hurting the uh, kind of uh, the kind of society we live in. The second issue is, uh, is perhaps science near exhaustion. Haven't we, we scientists, discovered everything worth discovering uh, and so forth? Why? Well, my answer is, of course, not. What we know about the physical and the life processes is so extraordinarily minute compared with what we don't know. And I have a confidence, deep confidence, that so much more can be learned. And as we learn more, and the technology picks up this information, converts it to, into better health, better agriculture, better defense, and so forth, uh, why there will always be other problems that are not yet solved. In fact, it's very characteristic of the way technology solves problems of our society. It solves one problem always just to create another one. And when I look uh, at your air around here and think how technology provided automobiles, I can cite that as one example. But uh, you can think more generally of uh, the fact that for many years now the technological solutions which brought a higher standard of living and so forth simply were not concerned with the pollution of our environment or only uh, paid lip service to it and now it's becoming quite obvious that this just can't go on forever and that calls for much more sophisticated technology
to avoid polluting the countryside, uh, the, meanwhile providing the same or still better services, and hence more sophisticated knowledge is needed. We also, I think, here in the United States have to begin facing up, and I don't think we have faced sufficiently up to this problem, the fact that thanks again to science and technology, mainly in the medical sciences, we managed to eradicate um, the great epidemics and many other diseases which were decimating human population. And as a result of this, we have created a really quite an incredible rate of population growth in the world, which these days means doubling of the population every 35 years. And I may remind you that the world population doubled in a period from the beginning of the Christian era until the 16th century. What took then 1,600 years to do now happens in 35 years. And if you think, if you project into the longer range future, you realize that nothing can be done to change this rate of growth in a matter of five or 10 or 20 years. And uh, therefore, we will have, or rather you will have, uh, I will a little at this moment feel as a comfortable feeling that I probably won't have to worry about it. Uh, you will have with a well, you'll have to live with a world population of maybe 12 billion people, and in an environment, I mean, with certainly today's technology, which is unable to provide the food for any or even the three billion people now in the world. And I submit that as the two-thirds or three-quarters of the world population, the have-nots, uh, continue being have-nots and continue being hungry, uh, this may lead to a really quite appalling political and military upheavals. And therefore, it's very much in our own interest as the have nation par excellence to concentrate our technology, our scientific thinking on the problem of how to ameliorate the existence of the other people in the world. And if you wish to put it that way, it's not being spoken in charitable spirit. I'm just saying for the sake of self-preservation, we ought to start worrying about it and pretty soon do something about it. So I think that there's still plenty of scientific problems and very exciting ones to tackle and many, many new technological innovations that can and in fact must come forth. Well, there is also a lot of criticism now, this is specifically of the federal government, uh, that uh, it's very unfair in the distribution of research funds. It makes the rich richer and the poor poor. Uh, uh, it's an awkward subject for a man to talk coming from a place which everybody else thinks is rich, but which we know to be very poor. Uh, nonetheless, I'll say a few words about it. I think if one talks in terms of this, get, make the rich richer and the poor poor, uh, as a sweeping statement, it's quite untrue. And one can again measure it. I'm talking about science exclusively, mind you. One can measure it in object, by objective criteria, by, for instance, looking the origin of scientific papers in modern scientific journals and comparing from how many places did scientific papers come 20 or 30 years ago. And what you discover is that then 
science was enormously more concentrated in a few so-called centers of excellence. It has extraordinarily spread throughout the country. By now, I know that in chemistry, for instance, 125 schools now grant uh, PhD degrees, and I mean thereby not only say that they are granting it, but actually grant. Uh, and before the war, the number was something of the nature of a dozen. And much of this spread of so-called centers of excellence uh, is due to the distribution of federal funds. This, however, applies to what other people have called little science. A professor working in a normal departmental laboratory with some graduate students, maybe a few research associates subsisting on the thin diet uh, of research project grants. That kind of science is well distributed geographically, not perfectly. I believe we have to make continuing efforts to improve this distribution. For instance, the Deep South uh, and even the Southwest uh, has perhaps not had its share of attention. And there the National Science Foundation program of so-called science development grants, which essentially uh, provides the straps, the bootstraps by which an institution can pull itself into a state of excellency if it really tries hard, five million dollars or so, is very valuable. But all of this applies to this little science, where a great imbalance and probably unavoidably exists is in the big science domain. I'm talking now about the large telescopes, radio telescopes, or the uh, high energy physics particle accelerators, and uh, oceanographic research vessels, special one-of-a-kind sort of equipment which actually undoubtedly always goes to the strongest place because the effective operation of one of these facilities requires a highly organized, organized large team effort and so you need, needless to say the government goes to a place where it can get it. Um, And because of that, there's a very severe un geographic imbalance. It, the big science has other very severe problems for the federal government. Um, it's fiscally completely open-ended. Where one can project on a fiscal basis, and I had a little to do in my life with budgets and federal government once upon a time, so I know a little bit about this process. One can project on almost demographic arguments how much the research budget should be increased annually in little science to take care of the rising number of graduate school or graduate students of a few new graduate schools a year and for the increasing sophistication of research. Uh, it's quite impossible to do in case of big science because the costs are all engineering costs uh, they, uh, there is not a great deal of difference between the number of physicists that used to work with a $10 million uh, um, proton accelerator, say, 15 years ago, uh, and uh, working with a $100 million machine now. And uh, as you know, we're now beginning, or not I, but I mean we in the editorial sense, the physicists, beginning to talk of a machine that might cost even a billion dollars. Um, I hope they don't get it. <laughs> because it'll something else won't get the money, and that'll be more important, perhaps, to the nation. There's also a 
comparatively very low relevance to the educational process. The number of students who get trained on this type of equipment relative to their cost is very limited. But I must admit that uh, such special projects, the big science is quite indispensable for certain type of frontier research, high energy physics in, as an example. It also has high political visibility. Just think of it that 120 congressmen have written to the Atomic Energy Commission making out case that the, the next big accelerator, the 200 BEV machine, should be put in their district. Uh, it actually speaks well for, uh, obviously, scientific education of congressmen, if it is to be interpreted that way. Uh, this kind of science has high political visibility big political returns. It also makes it exceedingly difficult to make policy decisions when the total amount of money is limited and when you're trying to decide what should we do, dig the more hole to the Mohorovich discontinuity under the bottom of the ocean or send one more, now I guess two more scientific satellites in space. That's about the same costs. And the criteria of choice between these this, uh, for this decision are extraordinarily difficult to come by, um, at least when sober. <laughs> there are a great deal of, uh, as I mentioned before, a great deal of political turmoil about science policy, and so it's really worthwhile to ask oneself a question, are there any uh, ideas about how can we ensure the welfare and growth of American science of the kind we know, because I, I at least for one believe that it's been extraordinarily good for American society. Well, there are two parties to this problem, one party is the government policy makers. I think it's terribly important that they preserve the dialogue with the scientific community they have maintained, that they don't become the big brother and make unilaterally all decisions, that they preserve the freedom of scientific choice, and that means, among other things, they don't destroy the system of research project grants even though, uh, for very good reasons, university administrations would prefer to have the money being given to them in lump sums, and they can then share it among the faculty. Uh, being a faculty member myself, I think differently about it. Uh, I think it's terribly important that our government doesn't overdo the uh, uh, enthusiasm about scientific spectaculars. Some of it is fine, but I think too much of it may not be so good. I think also it's very important currently now it's for the uh, federal policymakers to bear in mind that even though the social goals shift and now have become some extraordinarily worthy ones, anti-poverty, uh, urban renewal, anti-pollution and so forth, that the shift in social goals does not mean that one can say, oh well, surely scientific knowledge is all here for solution of these problems. Let's solve them by means of short-range engineering development only. I think the scientific community also has to be concerned about a number of things. 
first of all, it must recognize that there exists a very deep dichotomy between its own thinking and which is really that we are engaged in science because we enjoy it as an intellectual challenge and we see it, some of us at least, as a small part of a really cultural endeavor. And the fact that society as a whole doesn't support us for that reason, it supports us because it finds the project of scientific research useful socially. I think we also have to be, we, the academic community, scientific community, have to be very much aware that our research, regardless even of the federal agencies that provide the money for it, is in its own nature mission-oriented, and that mission orientation is education. And that means, of course, that what really is important is not only the results of scientific research, but also the process of scientific research. The process, the way we do it, must be done so that it doesn't interfere and actually aids education. And I think that's terribly important because if we scientists and academic community move too far from recognizing it and following that recognition by proper actions, then uh, some other elements in the society will force us to, to, so to speak, line up and do the right things, and that may be quite unpleasant the way it will be done. I think, and this in a way is my last point, I think also the academic community and scientific community must recognize that it has its own responsibilities for maintaining the dialogue with the federal government. This is something that other segments of American society have always done by sending their representatives to Congress, sometimes done it by not such elegant methods of lobbying, and lobbying is not something I recommend for the scientific society, but there are much more dignified means essentially of public education. For instance, there is a committee of the National Academy called Committee on Science and Public Policy in forming which I was very active and was a chairman for several years, which has deliberately attempted by means of carefully worked out public papers to convey the importance, the excitement, the significance of science to our society. There are many other activities. There is participation in study section, refereeing of research proposals. There's finally commuting to Washington on part-time advisory basis and being willing from time to time to take on a full-time jo job, even though it may be very painful from the point of view of one's local life. Scientific community, I think, must always bear in mind that some fruits of scientific knowledge can be put to evil uses as well as good ones. Um, the evil is not in knowledge, but it's in the way it's used. And I think a certain degree of concern must be exercised in educating the non-scientists to what different types of scientific knowledge may mean practically. I think if um, in 44, 45, there wasn't such a veil of secrecy over uh, the atom bomb project and much better education were possible of the political leaders of that time that things might have gone somewhat better than they did since 20 years ago. I think also we have got to be aware that technology, and that means back of it, science, has made it, in a way, uh, some difficulties for the man to live in our civilization. 
Perhaps it's uh, not all our doing, but we certainly have contributed to it. And I think, therefore, although we are natural scientists, I think we have, in a sense, um, ought to be at least in a supporting role, urging very vigorous development of behavioral sciences, which perhaps will solve some of the difficulties that a modern man encounters in civilized society, overcrowded cities, and otherwise. These may be fairly complicated requirements, but I think that they can be actually met. And I believe that if the both parties meet them, that American science will prosper. And what's even much more important, so will our very fine and unique society. Thank you very much. Despite the hard day that we've given Professor Kistiakowski over in chemistry and the, the evening, uh, he has nevertheless volunteered for questions. But inasmuch as we're not uh, set up with roving microphones, it has seemed best to us to uh, uh, adjourn at this point and have the questions on an informal basis as Professor Kistiakowski diffuses out the uh, front entrance. Uh, I'd like to thank Professor Kistiakowski at this time for his very thoughtful and thought-provoking talk this evening. <laughs>